Hi guys. Hi. For those who don't know me, my name is Joanna Scullion and HR Made Easy is my mission in life to make HR easy for small business owners out there. Okay. The reason I'm here today is over the past week or so, I have been immersing myself in becoming, making sure that I'm up to date on all things COVID and in particular in the plan to return to some kind of normality. And for my clients and for any small business owners out there who follow me, for what life is going to look like for us as we plan to reopen our businesses or reopen our trade again, because you might be reopening to trade, but you might not necessarily be reopening your premises. So what I have done is I thought I would do some guidance that some people out there here watching it might find useful. Those of you who know me, I'm a talker, so I have some notes in front of me to make sure that I stay on track, but I have quite a lot to cover. So this is definitely not a three minute video. It's gonna be one that's gonna be a little bit longer, but that's because I have some important information that I want to cover for you all. Okay. So, just to make sure when we're thinking about COVID-19 and when you're thinking about it from a HR perspective, the most important thing that you need to do is to make sure that the advice that you're looking at, the information and the guidance that you're taking is from reputable sources. And what are we talking about? Here in Northern Ireland, we are looking predominantly to the Northern Ireland executive and the information they provide. When that is distilled down on the website, that comes through either gov.uk, be very careful if you're using gov.uk information because oftentimes they'll link out to information that's relevant only in Northern Ireland. So you need to look at that. And where do you want to go? Well, you want to go to NI Business Info. And I know from the last couple of months, that's where a lot of people are spending their time, but it really is an excellent resource. And that is reputable information coming from the executive. Thirdly, then in Northern Ireland, you also want to look to the Labour Relations Agency. They are the statutory body and they are the body that produce the code of practices for employers and employees when it comes to all things to do with the employment relationship. So those are the three key areas that I would look at. The other thing to think about COVID-19 from an employer's perspective, if you have staff, yes, there's HR implications, but there's more importantly, there are health and safety implications because as an owner, as a director, you have the ultimate duty of care and the ultimate responsibility for the duty of care for your employees and any customers in your premises. And therefore that falls under health and safety legislation. So you also need to make sure you're taking into consideration the guidance from the health and safety executive here in Northern Ireland. Complete disclaimer, guys, I am not a health and safety trained individual. I don't pretend to be and anything that I am saying, I am pointing you to guidance here. I am not giving any health and safety advice at all. But you do need to be aware that managing your return to work is going to be double fold. It's looking at the health and safety legislation, but then it's also looking at the legal implications from the employment perspective. OK, so that's what we're talking about. The other thing that has been really, really good in the last couple of weeks that I've seen come forward are the trade bodies and the sector bodies. The government has been publishing information and they've been distilling it down either to the priority ca ca characters or category sorry, of businesses, but they've also been distilling it down by sectors, construction sector, hospitality sector, the care sector, the beauty, you know, the care industry as well, the beauty, the salons, what they're calling personal care, um, retail, hospitality, food and beverage. So look to your relevant trade body, whoever you are. If you have a trade body in your institute, in your profession, look to them for the guidance. They are the people who should be leading you through this, this pandemic. And they are the people who should be giving you guidance and codes of practice that are relevant to your business. Because what's relevant for a construction firm who have got workers working predominantly outside on site, and if it's, if it's on big capital bill projects, is completely different to what's relevant to a small joinery business whose work is all about working on interior fixes inside residential properties. So the guidance there will be completely different. It will broadly be the same, but the things that you'll have to consider and the risks your employee will be different. So please look to those sector bodies that you are relevant for you and your business. Okay, so for me as a HR professional, what matters most to me is the, inst the information that I'm given from my institute. And my institute is the Chartered Institute for Personnel and Development. That is our professional body that governs all things to do with the HR and learning professions. So that's where I go. And the Chartered Institute for Personnel and Development have published a guidance and a document, which I will be linking to, which is about planning that return to work post um, COVID-19 and in the new world with COVID-19 without a vaccine. Peter Cleese has come out and in that directive, they've made it very clear. The CIPD have stated that there are three tests 
three tests that businesses should pass before they bring their employees back into their place of work. Workplace is different from work from home, okay? So there are three things and the three things that they, he has said, is it essential for them to be in the workplace, i.e. the building? Is it safe for them to be in that building? And has it been mutually agreed for them to be in that building? And I'm just gonna break that down for you. You know, so is it essential? The guidance is very clear. Work from home should be the norm for the foreseeable future if you're able to continue to do that. So is it essential for your employee to be in the office? So for example, if you are one of the uh, garages that's providing essential maintenance work to keep vehicles on the road for first responders and primary care workers, then it's essential that you do that work in the premises that has all of the equipment. However, in the same building, um, does the office manager need to be in the office? Is it essential for them to do their job in that office or can they continue to do that job using the work from home setting that you set up? So what I would say, any business out there that has had work from home in place and it has been working successfully and it is not essential that your staff are in their place of work in the building, then I would let that continue for as long as possible. If the work is not essential, then you need to look, am I continuing on furlough or are we looking at alternatives? And most importantly, look to the guidance for your sector. That's where that sectorial guidance that I mentioned comes into place. Look at what your code of practice is coming from your trade body. Do they recommend that you should be opening now or do they recommend that you should be still continuing to work from home? So that's the is it essential criteria. The second one, is it safe? And this is where the health and safety comes into it. As an employer, the ultimate responsibility and duty of obligation of care sits with you and you alone. So you need to make sure that your workplace is safe. Now, generally speaking up to now, offices were deemed to be a relatively safe working environment. Now, as we know, with the pandemic and COVID-19, any enclosed space is no longer as safe as it was before this pandemic. So we need to look at things differently. So you need to make sure that your workplace is free and safe from risk. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can do that in the next slide. Is it mutually agreed? And what that means is the word important there is mutually. Have both parties, both parties being you and your employee, agree that the return to work is right. CIPD have made it very clear. There needs to be clear dialogue between both parties. Both sides need to be flexible, both the employer and what they're expecting of their employees and the employees and what they're expecting of their employer. These are on charter ter territories and whilst at the minute the furlough scheme is there and covering 80% of the wages, we know that from August that's going to change and whether or not that's viable for a lot of businesses to contain if that government support has been reduced is open to question. So you need to take in into account both the employee's need and the employer's need. And that for don't just categorically issue out a statement, we're opening the office and you must come back next week. You must make sure it's mutually agreed, okay? The CIPD again have made it even further clear that even with those three measures in place, essential, safe and mutually agreed, work from home should be gradual sorry the phase to return to the office should be gradual it's not open your doors and bring everyone in at once it should be done on a gradual basis and the reason for that is so that you can test the measures that you've put in place in terms of your risk assessment and your new methods of working to minimize the spread of the disease so you need to make sure that's done gradually so that social distancing can be maintained and that you can look after your staff Okay, so that's the CIPD's perspective and I've linked to that, that detailed document as well in the comments below. Okay, so assuming you've made the decision that you do feel it's essential that your workers are returning to the workplace, where do you go next? The next step is, is it safe? Again, a disclaimer, I'm not a health and safety executive, but what or expert rather, but what I can do is summarise the guidance that I've been collating in, over the last couple of weeks. And again, I refer out to the relevant pieces of information and I stress that you must do this yourself. 
What you need to do is do your risk assessments. Don't wait until you're ready to open. If you're one of those businesses, particularly in the hospitality or the personal care industry, the beauticians, the, the hairdressers, and you know it's gonna be later in the summer when you're gonna be looking to open, use this time now to do this work. If you're a business that wants to open at the start of June, definitely get on top of this now. So what are you looking at? You're looking at the guidance that you need to follow. The guidance now about having a safe place of work is different to the guidance we had in January. The Labour Relations Agency, along with a number of other statutory agencies, have come together and they have published a document called COVID-19, working through this together. This has now been endorsed by the executive and this is now our new code of practice around operating a safe working environment. I have a link to that PDF below and it's really important that you look at that. So there is also the risk assessment templates. I have given you two examples. One is the blank template from the Health and Safety of the Executive here in Northern Ireland. But a second one that I've linked to is a completed one that the CIPD have done for us as an example in light of a COVID situation. So they've looked, taken COVID and they've filled in a hypothetical risk assessment form based on how they would manage those risks in a business environment. And I think it's really useful to look at that, to take lead from that. That's a very good resource to have. So that's the good practice, the health and safety executive, the LRA, the CIPD, and again, any sectoral, any advice you're being given from your sector, be construction, hospitality, uh, trade, beauty, anything like that, make sure you follow your sector guidance. And I'm sure there should be more resources coming from your trade bodies as well. But things that you could be doing now is, first of all, we know you have to maintain that social distancing in your office. And what does that mean physically? That means you need to start configuring your office. You need to, any desk, for the minute I'm sitting at a desk and in some offices, somebody would be directly opposite me. That can't happen anymore. You're going to have to reconfigure your desks. You're going to have to reduce the number of people in that office. Things that you want to think about are putting in place a one-way system. For small spaces, for example, bathrooms, kitchens, if it's just a wee small kitchen, um, any other document rooms or storage rooms, if they're small confined spaces, it might be you need to put in place a one in, one out signage. The other thing is that you need to think about there should be no shared resources. So the idea of everybody sharing the same photocopier, that's no longer acceptable. You need to mitigate that risk. Again, I'm not an expert. Things you might want to put in place are the people use gloves when they use that shared photocopier. Ideally, in my perspective, you just ban photocopying unless people have their own individual uh, machines. The other things is, even when you do return to the office, it doesn't mean you should start having meetings. The guidance is very clear. Even when you're in the building, your meetings should be conducted over video call or telephone conversation. The idea is to limit the amount of time you're sitting in close proximity with somebody. Even with your two meters apart inside a shared space, it is deemed to be a higher risk. And therefore, what can you do as an employer to mitigate that risk? You hold your meetings via Zoom. Sounds a bit mad, but I think if you really want to take the lowest risk approach here, that's what you need to think about. The other thing that's been very clear, particularly from the legal training that the barrister was given to us, is that your signage is really, really important. Take the lead from the shops that you've been in for the last three months. They all have their yellow and black tape. They all have their X's. They have their X in front of the till. They have the X where two meters is. If you're down a shopping aisle, I haven't been in the shops. My husband's done it all because I've been self-isolating. Um, but he tells me that when he's in the shop, there are spaces marked out. So if he's here and there's somebody in front of him, unless they've moved from that box, he can't move. So they're the kind of things you want to be doing in your business. And it sounds mad if you have a small business, but this is you protecting your employees, but it's also protecting your risk because you've shown to take action. You need to put signs up everywhere about the hand washing. Follow the guidance about having hand washing materials. You need to put signs up everywhere around um, common touch point areas that people need to disinfect. You definitely need to have your floor markings in place. If you're doing a one way system, put floor markings in place. Use black mask and tape, use any kind of tape, but put floor markings in, particularly if this is a different way of working than what you had before, which for most people it will be. Make sure it is completely dummy proof that people know where they're walking. For example, if you have, I'm thinking of the toilets, it'll be one in, one out. If you have cucubicles, it could be that you have an X where the sink is and then you have another X where the next person stands beside them. If you have a canteen or even somewhere where you just boil your kettle, have an X where the person is boiling the kettle and then put another X two metres apart where the next person can stand. The same with your fridge where you're storing your lunches. It might mean that you need to rejig your kitchen 
that's okay. It might mean that you look at your kitchen and say, this is too small, only one person can win at a time. These are the things you need to be doing now, okay? Also, the other thing I would say is about travel to work. If in the past, in terms of sustainability and a good corporate ethos, you have encouraged cars to uh, staff to carpool and to share lifts, you need to stop that. They should not be sharing a car unless they're in the same household. So please make sure if that's something you've done from an environmental point of view, you need to relook at that policy. My advice, my guidance would be that um, nobody should be sharing a vehicle unless they're from the same home. Okay. Look again at the advice and advice your sector and your trade bodies are given to you. So that's your risk assessments. If you're going to do the work, make sure you record it. Do that risk assessment. Do that risk assessment for your staff entering the building. Look at your car parking spaces. If your building has a keypad to enter, is there something that you can do for that? Is it that you can disable that in the short term when people go through and they're, somebody's now at a reception desk? Look at how you're gonna manage that. Obviously we have screens as well or things that are becoming commonplace as well. There are a lot of businesses out there that can help you, particularly here, I'm gonna say support local in Northern Ireland. So make sure you get that information. Think what you should be doing to make your business safe. Okay, remind people of by the signage. Signs everywhere, guys. Seriously, signs on your lifts, signs on shared surfaces, signs about reminding people to wash their hands. Make sure you do all of this. Why am I emphasizing this fact? It's because this is your duty of care, but also if you do your risk assessment, if you write it up, if you put the signage in place and you do the training, this is all evidence that you as an employer have met your obligations, which will minimize any risk for you for future claims should staff become sick in your environment. Okay, the next thing we're gonna move on to is point three. So we're looking at the CIPD three steps. We've confirmed whether or not it's essential. We've done our, is it safe? And now we're talking about our mutually agreeing it with the staff. And this is what I talk, talk about as comms, communications. And HR is all about communication. If you've followed me for any length of time, you know I am all about the best HR is informal HR. And by that, I mean having conversations. Don't let things fester. Don't let things drift, drift on. Don't have any ambiguity. Have conversations. In the environment that we're in at the minute, you are absolutely going to make sure that you follow up everything in writing because of the risk to you and to make sure that you manage this time period. One thing I would say as a HR professional, you do not want to be that employer that takes a chance because none of us know what cases are coming down the line and I don't want to bring the vibe down, but the reality is somebody out there is going to bring a case for their employer, whether it's a breach of health and safety, whether it's that they feel they've been untreated treated over furlough for unfair selection, whether if your business is going to have to make redundancies that hasn't been handled correctly, whether it is that you haven't taken consideration of their, their ability to return to work, have you discriminated against them? Cases are coming, guys. There's no doubt about it but you don't want to be that employer. So take, take heed, take time, do things right. Even if you think, oh, my team are okay and, and there's only four of us and we'll look after each other. It's hard to think about that in six months or in 12 months or people are sitting unemployed and they think that there's a claim against their employer. So I don't want to emphasize that, but I do need to be real here. And this is real talk. You need to look after your staff and you need to do it right. In the past, if you haven't been up to date on all of your HR, this is the time to get it right, okay? So how do you agree with your staff, this idea of mutually agreed? You want to make sure it's in writing. So the first thing that I'm going to say is I'm going to direct you to the way, if you have staff on furlough and you're talking about bringing them back to the office, then what have you put in writing in that furlough letter? Did you have a date on that? Did you link it into the government scheme? Did you say it would roll on a week by week basis? Look at what you've put in that communication and make sure you're following that. If you have staff on work from home, Again, you should have had some written guidance around that work from home because you've changed the main term of their employment. So that should have been followed up that that was a temporary arrangement. Again, look to what you've already said that you'll do and make sure you're following through on that. If you need to change that, then you need to communicate with your employee. So the next thing, what you need to do is start to communicate about this return to work. You want to open your workplace and this is all about the idea of opening your workplace. So if you want to open your workplace, you need to communicate with them. So you need to write to them. And here's roughly what I would do if I were in your shoes. I would write the letter. The first thing I would do is say thank you. 
you know, this is tough on all of us. As business owners, we've had a lot of pressure. We've had a lot of stress. Financially, it's really, really difficult and uncertain times. And sometimes you're just, the adrenaline is pushing you through because you're so relieved that you're at this stage maybe of reopening your doors that you might forget to do the personal side of it and have a little bit of empathy by bringing your staff in. You might be thinking, oh, they should be so glad to get back to work. They might have concerns. So I would start with thank you. Thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for being so good if you're working from home. Thank you for whatever they've done. You know, just make sure you say thank you and acknowledge the fact that we're all in this together. Don't go straight in with, I'm your boss, you're my employee, and this is what you have to do. Acknowledge the fact that this is very much a partnership. Then I would move on to say, here's what we have done to manage the risk in our business from our health and safety. And I would list the changes that you've put in place. I would list if you've rearranged your office. I would list that you've put in a one-way system. I would list that you've increased your hand sanitizers, etc. I would put those all in. Here's what we've done. You might not want to put it in a letter, but say, here's a separate one-page document. These are the physical changes we have made to minimize the risk in this building. Um, then I would move on then to the next, the third part is, we're now ready to open. We've carried out our risk assessments. We feel it's essential to get back to work and we need to reopen our workplace. And here's what we plan to do. I wouldn't be saying on a Friday, we're reopening on a Monday. I would be given notice. And I think the more notice you can give your staff, the better. Don't be waiting until a few days beforehand. This is gonna be a conversation. This is gonna be a massive shift. Um, and if you bear in mind when lockdown happened, everybody shut together within a couple of days. So everybody was in the same boat. Now that the economy is reopening, it's phased and everybody's doing it at different times. So that's shared from a psychology point of view, that's shared, we're all in this together. We're all going back to work, isn't gonna be the same. Some employees might be very anxious and might think, I don't want to go back to work. Such and such isn't back to work yet. I don't know anybody back to work. Somebody else on the other side might be, make that quiet. Somebody else on the other side could be going, I'm desperate to get back to work. My friends have been working for two weeks. So they're all in different levels here. So you need to make sure you handle this conversation. So give them notice. This is our plan that we would plan to return. It's going to be phased. And again, if you follow the guidance, you need to think about things about um, staggered opening hours, having staff in in different shifts, and even as simple of the fact that they all arrive in the building within 15 minute allocations. So if you're thinking, well, it doesn't matter, we're all going to come in together, then they're all going to be in the building together. Have them sh stagger that space. That enables the social distancing to come through. They all come in 15 minute different slots. Um, if possible, if you have a bigger organisation, think of teams of people, and this is the advice and the guidance, that you have people in teams. And the idea behind that, the concept behind that is to enable contact tracing. So should anybody get sick, if you've minimized those people, just like we've done in our household, if you've minimized it to a team of three, so if Jimmy gets sick, he's only worked with Joanna and Mary, then I only need to worry about Joanna and Mary. But if Jimmy's worked with everybody, then I need to worry about everybody. So if possible, you put people in teams. So if people are sharing an office, for example, their team, they're one team. If people are sharing a work area, they're another team and try and have it that they, those teams will socialize together. They will have their breaks together. They will have their lunches together so that, you know, there's no point in having a team, uh, team A and a team B, but then they all have lunch together. That doesn't make sense. So these are the kind of things that you want to be thinking about. So you're telling them, so that, sorry, I've gone off track a bit, but you want to tell the employee what's different about coming back. So we're coming back phased or we're doing half a team in one day, half a team in the other day and work from home the rest of it. And then this is most important. You want to then ask the employee to contact you to confirm that they're coming back and that they're able to come back. Some people might say, I'm gonna put my head in the sand and tell them they're open and they need to come back and that's it. No, we're in extraordinary times. My guidance to you is ask them to confirm to you. Those who confirm, great, you can put it in place. Those who don't pick up the phone, those who don't reply to the email, then you now know, right, there's an issue. So are you gonna bury your head in the sand and ignore it? Or are you going to address it head on? You know what I'm going to say, you're going to have to address it. So by asking them to contact you, if you haven't heard from them within the 48 hours and we put a date on it, then that gives you the reason to pick up the phone and contact them and to start that dialogue where there are issues about somebody returning. Okay, so that's the comms. Okay, going down to the next one. 
The next thing I want to do is the HR. So this is all HR, but these are the things that I'm thinking of that I would want my clients to be doing and that I would want small businesses to be doing if I was advising them. So the return to work planning that I would be doing right now. First of all, it's all about the plan. Take time to plan. Hopefully I've given you some guidance today, things that you have maybe already done. Maybe I'm talking about things that you haven't done. So take time to do that plan. Get your return to work paperwork done now. If you need signage, which you do, order that now. If you want to get signs that you can stick up and you want to go all fancy and you want to get a company to do them for them, find out who those companies are. Get your order in now. Don't be last to do it if you want to open. Worst case scenario, there's a great thing online called canva.com and it has a whole area of templates for free uh, COVID-19 templates. Just Google them and you'll get free examples and you can then tailor them for your business. There are so many out there that you can now download yourself. Just download print on your printer that you're using on your own. You're not sharing it with anybody and you get those signs up. That's stuff you could be doing now. Okay, don't leave that to the last minute. If you need to mask and tape to share to do signage in your floor, which I'm saying you should be doing, get that mask and tape now. Think about your floors. Okay. Second thing I would do is I wouldn't do the training on the day they come back. I would do the training now. Don't wait until they come back. Train them now. And what kind of training are you talking about? You have completely changed how you're doing business. Your health and safety ethos in your business is completely different to what it was in February. So you need to retrain those staff. And then what I would do is I would do that training over Zoom. Now, some people don't like being live on camera. That's fine. I get it. But hopefully you'll get used to Zoom camera. Do your training, whether it's you create a PowerPoint presentation and you record it and you do a voiceover. There's a great software called Loom.com that enables you to record your screen as you talk. Or secondly, maybe you want to record a video and you just want to then upload that to a private channel on YouTube and people can watch it. Or you share to your shared cloud. If you use Google Cloud or iCloud or OneDrive, share that video into the shared environment so staff can watch it at their own time. But you need staff to confirm they've done that training. So what do you want to do in that training? Whether it's live or whether it's recorded, first of all, you want to say, what's new? So what, do, what have we never done before that we're doing? Things like there's a one-way system, you know, one person in this room at one time. Cover all the things that are new to your employees. doesn't matter how long they've been with you. This is something new to them. What's no longer allowed? So be very clear. What's no longer allowed? Smoke breaks. Two people standing side by side, sharing under an umbrella, no longer allowed. Two people in our, what we call our breakout room, which is two foot wide, no longer allowed. People coming to work in the shared car, no longer allowed. Make sure you highlight anything that's no longer allowed. Shared photocopier, no longer allowed. Tell them what's different from before. So yes, we're still doing this, but we now do it differently. If somebody's on a desk and they've now got a screen in front of them for protective measures, explain that. If it's a case that they must sanitize their station after every time they use it, explain that. Most likely hot desking is gone. Every employee should be signed a workstation that is theirs alone. Explain that. Okay, so say what's different. And then what I would do is I would follow up with written guidance as to what you've done. If you're good and you can create it all fancy, brilliant. If you're scared about that, just do a Word document. And if you don't want to do a Word document, get pen and paper, write it out take pictures and send it to them. Like even if you're a small business and you're used to communicating through WhatsApp, you can still do these measures, but just um, moderate them for you and your business. And then I would also think about having a workplace checklist that people should have. I would have on every employee's hands, wash your hands for at least 20 seconds, wash them more frequently than normal. Wash them as a minimum when you enter the building and when you leave the building. And when you move, you know, give those guidance that we all know was out there in March, make sure you refresh that. And particularly, I would probably say have antibacterial wipes on your desk and ask your employees to clean those desks down at the end of the day. You need to make sure you have regular cleaning in place and that includes deep cleaning. But you also have to think about the person doing that cleaning. So if employees use a desk and clean it at the end of the day, then they know they're coming back to a clean space tomorrow. So those are the kind of things. These are temporary measures, but they could be with us for a longer period of time. So think about what you're doing. And then I'm going to go back to my point on signage. This is part of your training. Get that signage everywhere. Have it on their desks, have it on their areas, have it in front of the toilet. Don't tell people it's one in, one out. Put a sign in the door to say it's one in, one out. Um, if you were a business where beforehand you used an actual physical towel in your toilets, completely gone. You need to use tissue paper now or an air dryer. 
you need to look at that. I'm, again, I'm not an expert, but I wouldn't, I can't use somebody else's towel. So you wouldn't expect your employees to do that. Um, so again, all of this coming together collectively is you creating the evidence that you have met your statutory obligation for the duty of care that you have for your employees coming back to work, okay? So this may sound like overkill, but believe you me guys, if somebody, God forbid, got sick in your business, you want to make sure that you've done everything. Morally, you want to make sure you've done everything to make sure their environment was safe. But legally, you want to make sure that you've done everything to protect yourself from any risks of any claims in the future. Okay. So that's the idea. Everyone's coming back. It's all going to be easy. It's all straightforward. But we all know when you're dealing with people, it's never that straightforward and there will be issues. I'm not going to sit here and say there are going to be issues. There will be issues. Um, the one that I'm not going to cover today, but I'll do a separate piece on it, is definitely there will be redundancies coming further down the line for some businesses out there who just haven't been able to tra trade through this. Um, and that's that's too big a topic for me to do here. I'll do a piece on that separately. But things that I want to talk about are a few special cases. So what the advice is coming to us as professionals is just what I linked in earlier on. Guys, you do not want to be the person that takes the first decision to either discipline somebody because of COVID-19 or dismiss somebody because they didn't return to work when you opened your business. You don't want to be that person. The case law hasn't even been written yet and we don't know what's happening down the line. So therefore that idea of what is reasonable, I don't know. So I would be advising with you is to treat everything with caution. And if you're thinking about making any of those rash decisions about a disciplinary action or dismissal for somebody who's not coming back to work, take legal advice. It's going to be so scary. So let's look at two kind of cases that I thought might come up for most people. Number one is childcare responsibilities. And that's absolutely going to impact me and how I run my business. My three, I have got two now in primary and one in first year. Um, so for the last couple of years, I've been able to work full day Monday and nine to three the rest of the week. So I work very much the kids hours and in the summer then um, I try and juggle it and squeeze my work in the morning. So we still have time off in the afternoon. But for the foreseeable future, I'm going to be homeschooling. So how feasible is it for me to be able to do my job? And I have a P4 and a P6 and a first year. And whilst they are definitely getting older, it's not as easy as it is when you're in the office on your own. So I need to be aware of how much work I can take on because the work that I do, I need to be focused on, I need attention and I need to be on top of my game. And a client doesn't need to have me on a phone call with them and for somebody else obviously taking my attention in the background. So for me, I'm going to change how I'm going to work. And I know for a lot of people out there, that's the reality. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to have to look, if you're planning to reopen in June, you're going to have some ch uh, people out there that don't have childcare anymore. They just don't have it for the foreseeable future for whatever reason whether it was granny whether it was a crash setting or or whatever or school even school time hours they're just not there so you're going to have to look at that there's no point in ignoring it when an employee comes to you and says i can't come back next week my partner's a first a frontline worker and i'm doing childcare. i have no way okay that's that's a conversation that's going to happen in many businesses out there so what you want to do is look at the conversation have the conversation don't ignore it don't ignore it First of all, first option is always going to be, can they work from home? If they've been working from home up to now and you're opening your business, can they continue to do that? I would absolutely encourage any employer out there to make the work from home conversation work for you and for your employee. It might be a case of, you know what, I can work from home, but what I'm struggling with is attending Zoom meetings during the day because I've got a two and a four year old and they won't let me be on the video. Or I'm more than happy to work, but I can't get online until eight o'clock at night. Guys, I built my business starting at eight o'clock at nine o'clock at night and working to two in the morning for five years i did that my husband laughed i opened my office door at nine o'clock kids went to bed at seven him and i had an hour between seven and eight half eight nine o'clock i went in turned on my laptop and i did my work because i had one childcare day a week when i did meetings everything else i did at night i took my phone calls between 12 and 2 because they both napped at the same time and Aaron was in primary school so i get it i've done it so you can do it. It's not good. It's not good long term. Suffer from it, but you can do it. So if any business owner, if you've got an employee out there saying, I can do it, but I need to do it after hours. You need to, you need to make that work, guys. That's the reality. Um, think about how you can make it work. Can it be that the nature of their work is different? Can you change that? 
Also, look at the policies that you have. Every business that's in statutory legislation that every employee is entitled to dependence leave to care for a child in unexpected circumstances. Dependence leave is unpaid leave in the legislation. And up until now, we'd have always say what is reasonable would be two days unpaid to allow an employee to make alternative arrangements. In light of COVID-19, employees can't make alternative arrangements because they can't go to the grandparents, creches are shut, schools are shut. So what it could be the conversation and the solution for many of you out there may be, listen, if you can't work from home, because I can either, maybe they're refusing to work from home, they can't do it. Or maybe uh, it's that you physically need them back in the office now and they're saying, well, I can't do that. Then you could be looking at dependence leave and that will be a period of unpaid leave. I would put a time period on that and I would put a review date on that. That could be your alternative. The other thing may be that the employee might say, listen, I've got holidays. We're not going away in July and August now. My wife's going to be off or my husband's going to be off. He's going to take over the kids. So I'm going to use my holidays for June. Those are the kind of things that you want to do. Find a, an acceptable solution for the two of you. The other thing is you may want to consider putting that person on furlough. Um, if somebody else returning and this person isn't in a position to, so maybe they can go into that furlough scheme. That's unique to your business. That's something you could be looking at. The other thing is, um, if somebody says, no, listen, I, I just want to change my hours, encourage them to follow, even though we're in COVID-19 and the world's been a little bit shaky, um, they still need to put in a formal f flexible working request. And I would encourage them to do that. And I, I can do a video on that as well. Um, but that's just because you accept a flexible working request. It can be for a temporary period of time. So that could be something you might say, we'll put this in place for the next three months and then we'll review it. It's not a permanent change. It's a temporary change until we review things. So things like that, you need to follow the, the normal processes. So anything that you do, have the conversation, but then follow it up in writing and agree what you've agreed to do. And please, guys, don't be going into that. In the past, if somebody refused to turn up for work, I'd be looking at unauthorised absence. And on day two, you have not been able to make contact. I would start disciplinary investigation for a dismissal under gross misconduct. I would not be telling any client to do that right now. It is a strange time. Do not take strong action, whether that's disciplinary action, or whether that's dismissal action, or whether that's a redundancy action for anybody and how they respond to returning to work in COVID-19. If you're in a situation where you really don't know what to do, please get advice. The free advice is the LRA or come to a professional like myself or a solicitor or an employment barrister and get the advice that you need. But don't be making any rash decisions because the, the guidance we would give now is completely different to what we would have done um, even four months ago. Okay. The other special case, and I'm coming to the end of it, we're nearly wrapping up. The other special case that you might want to consider on the return to work phase is anybody who's shielding. So for definition, anybody who's shielding is somebody who's received the government letter to say that they are shielding because they fall into that high risk, high vulnerable categories. So if somebody's shielding that, you know, you can ask them for that letter. If you're dubious, you don't trust them, ask them for sight of the letter. But if they're shielding, then the advice has always been from the government. If somebody's shielding, they need to be at home. And the first thing is that they should be working from home. The first thing is the guidance says if somebody's shielding and they can't work from home, then they're entitled to SSP. But what we have found um, from what I find from the, the advice that I've been given and the training that I've received is for most businesses, for an employee, if they're on SSP, it's, it's minimal. It's the 90 something pound a week. Whereas what some businesses have done, OK, if you're shielding um, and you're on SSP, I'd rather put you on furlough and at least you can get 80 percent of your wage. They felt that's the right thing to do whilst the government schemes in place. So that's something that some businesses might want to look at. Um, bear in mind, make sure that your letter is drafted correctly, it's because if the government substitute decreases, which we expected to happen in August, given their recent statements, then you might want to make sure that any pay that you're given is decreased in line with the government subsidy. So that's why you need to make sure that letter is written correctly. OK, where somebody is shielding, if they are working from home for you, please don't forget about them just because everyone else is back in the office. Remember those people that are working from home. Make sure they're invited into any Zoom calls that you're having because you're not going to have your meetings in a room. You're going to have them on Zoom, even though you're in the same building. Make sure you invite them in. I would introduce a regular daily call. Don't just rely on text messages because we can all lie from a text message. Let's be honest. It's like the other side of this camera is a mess. You know, we can all lie behind the screen. So I wouldn't just rely on text. Surely text messages are good, but I would reach out and make proper contact. That will be a telephone conversation. Yes, following up on work, but asking, can I do anything else? How are you getting on with that? Do you need any more support on that? But then just from the social aspect, how are you doing? How are you surviving? 
how many walks have you been done today to make sure you got away from the other half and the kids have that social interaction with people because working from home and shielding is a lonely time um and it's definitely going to make their anxiety heightened whenever they have to come back into the real world after being in that little bubble so remember just because they're working from home their health is still your responsibility so make sure you look after that as well The other one um, that I just want to cover, which is um, second last slide. What happens, again, God forbid, I'm touching wood. What happens if somebody in your business develops COVID-19 or they have tested positive for COVID-19 or somebody in their household has developed COVID-19 or tested positive for COVID-19 and therefore your employee has to self-isolate? Two things here. Number one, you have a duty of care to the other employees to so come in contact with that individual to tell them they've been in contact with somebody who's either tested positive for COVID-19 or somebody who's sharing a home with somebody who's tested COVID-19 and therefore they're self-isolating. But you have also a duty of care not to reveal their identity. You cannot, you cannot say who of your employees has tested positive for COVID-19 or is self-isolating self because of COVID-19. Absolutely clear. Now, if you have a team of two people and one person is shielding, you can't do it. You can't say it's, it's Jimmy. You just can't. Now, if they've guessed, nothing you can do about that. If the employee themselves says, guys, it's me, I've got it, I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. That's fine. But you as the employer cannot confirm that. You have to say a member of staff who was in the building on this update has now tested and is self-isolating. Therefore, anybody we recommend in your environment needs to test. And that's where it comes back to what I was saying earlier about having your teams or your bubbles. Think same of your household. If one person gets it in that team, then they're the people you contact trace. But if they've been mixing with everybody, then you need to tell everybody. So you have a duty of care to make sure you tell other employees when somebody is tested positive for it or has to self-isolate. But you also have a duty of care under data protection not to reveal that person's source and you cannot confirm it. Up to, if they want to do it, that's fine. If people guess, that's fine. You cannot be seen to confirm it. Interesting one, okay? So I'm looking at time, 40 minutes. I didn't think it would be this long, but anyway, I hope it's been useful. Um, there's a lot there, guys, and I know it's a scary time for businesses, for business owners who are trying to get back up on their feet again and trying to trade through this. We know it's a difficult time, but there is hope out there. There has never been more information. Like the benefit of the internet is amazing. The amount of information that's up there, it has maybe taken some places longer than others to get up to speed, but the information out there now is second to none. And I would advise you, the links below, please click them. You know, there's one, one of the pages on NI Info and LRI has so many FAQs, I couldn't even think of half of the questions. So there's really, really good information there. If you want to reopen your doors, start planning now. Start planning now. And if it means you wanted to reopen next week and haven't heard me today, you're going, I'm not ready. Delay your reopening. Absolutely delay it. Because what you don't want to do is reopen and have to close again because somebody's caught the illness or because you weren't in, you weren't in the right place. What I would say in terms of that planning, obviously I'm thinking about the planning from the HR perspective, but just to meet that first criteria, is it essential that we reopen and my employee returns to the workplace? Run your financials. Can you continue to run the business of work from home? I have already heard of some small businesses out there who have said they've given notice on their rental properties because they've realized work from home is working so well for them. And secondly, the rental properties they have, they cannot configure for social distancing. So they've taken the decision, they've given notice on the rental properties and they're continuing to work from home until the right premises come up for them. So you don't have to be in your building, just challenge your thinking on that. So run your financial numbers, do you need to reopen? And then what costs are, what are your costs gonna be like when you reopen compared to when you're staying closed? And you know this more than me guys, you know the costs in your business, but have that conversation with yourself, your accountant, run your numbers. And secondly, I would also say, reach out to your customers, survey your customers, what is the need? Do they need you back in? Because you might think I'm gonna open my doors and everyone's coming. Um, I'd say the hairdressers know that everyone's coming when they open their doors, considering what we're all like. Um, but for other businesses, you know, 
is it do you need to open your door so i would start surveying customers do you need us what do you need from us how would you want that delivered what are their hesitations and that might inform your own decision making as to how they're doing businesses what i would say the one thing if you're going to take this away from this uh training and um, for this guidance talk is where possible continue the work from home model i think without doubt that is going to be your lowest risk approach to all of your problems whether that's to get everybody to work from home or whether that's to deal with those specific cases we talked about or whether that's where you feel your health and safety isn't up to date i would continue to work from home longer than you feel you want to because it's absolutely going to minimize your risk um because what you don't want to do is reopen and have to close again that's my feeling that's my gut feeling if you do reopen go back over the re recap is it essential is it safe and has it been mutually agreed between you and your employees so to do that make sure you do your risk assessments make sure you document everything make sure you do the training before they come back in make sure you document the training make sure you have signage everywhere turn your building into a yellow and black and uh signage system just tra signage everywhere um and don't get lax don't go well you know what jimmy down the road he's not doing this he's got everybody and it's a free-for-all just because jimmy down the road's doing that doesn't mean it's right Look after your business, look after your staff, look after your customers and do it right. Until the guidance change, follow the guidance to the letter. And then the last thing I would say is stay up to date with the sources. The links that I'm giving them to you, um, so the links that are below, as I said, I've collated, cur curated those because I feel they're really useful information and they're reputable pieces of information. But keep clicking on those because they will be updated. When something new comes out in NI Business Info, that page that you click on will be up to date. So it's a very minimum if you're sitting and you're not too sure what's going on get into the practice that at least on a monday and a friday or a monday and a thursday you check those websites and see what's relevant for you and if you're in a sector or in a trade and you're not a member of a trade body then go and find out how you become a member because those organizations have been doing great work for their members i was sent guidance from the irish spa association um, and it is an, a tremendous piece of information for anybody in that industry so i know that others are out doing the same Okay, guys, clock says 47 minutes. I'm getting hoarse. Um, I hope this is useful. Uh, it's completely free. Um, obviously, there's a disclaimer. This is not advisory. This is not legal advice. This is not professional advice. Um, and I can't accept any responsibility for any actions or, or on actions that you take. And there's a disclaimer at the front to say that. That's me protecting my business. Um, but I still, I wanted to do something for the business community out there. I wanted to try and help and give this free information for any small business owners out there who are thinking about re reopening their premises and how to manage their staff and how to treat them and honour the duty that they have for their duty of care. Okay, guys, that's it. Um, any questions, any feedback, any other topics that you'd like me to discuss, please drop me an email at joanna at joannascullion.com, joanna with a H, or just DM me on whatever platform you're on. Thanks very much, guys, and have a great weekend.